So you don't go much to the states? I do. Okay. Just not California lately? No, maybe I've not been to California. Okay. See, I, I've been to San Francisco. We were talking about San Francisco. I've been to San Francisco within the last year and a half. Hmm. We just have a little bit of background noise, but I'm not going to worry about that. Keep everything away from the water. <laughs> I got through with this cable there. Yeah. Yeah, you sound good. I sound good. What is the best way for me to address you? Your holiness? Swami. Swami? Parama. Okay. Paramadvai. Swami Paramatri. And you're born in Germany. I just want to get all my stats correct. I will actually do an introduction prior to the recorded interview so I can take the time to do it properly. Um, and we can just speak about yoga and eco villages and anything that you think is important for people to know right now at this time in the world. Tower of Strength. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we'll explain it when we hear the noise in the background and you get full credit for that one. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Swami Paramadvati. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Magda, for inviting me to this beautiful place, Rishikesh, and this beautiful venue of the International Yoga Festival. Mm, it is such an honor to be sitting here with you today. We are in Rishikesh at the International Yoga Festival, the 29th annual. We just came from a ceremony where the Prime Minister was addressing us and there's been a lot of excitement and a lot of conversation about the importance of yoga and I was very much impressed by how he talked about my paraphrasing, of course, the way the, the takeaway I got from him is how yoga is a solution to bringing humanity back together, about reconnecting us with the earth. And I was, I was very impressed with his perspective, someone in, in his stature of political power. And it gives me hope for the world because, as we know in recent events, um, the United States election, um, a lot of people have been perhaps concerned for the world at large with. The, the way things, the direction things have gone. So for me personally, I'm getting a lot of, I found a lot of hope listening to him talk about yoga as a solution. It's something that I deeply believe and the reason that I've created this podcast is to spread the message of yoga and how important it is as a solution to so many of the world's problems. Um, but I would love to hear more about your background and what Can yoga Can I say something you. about what you just said? Please. Uh, Magda. We have been hearing about the terrible environmental crisis. We have been hearing about the global one. We have been hearing about the big corporations doing damage, damage, damage everywhere in their greed. Nevertheless, there never have been more animals killed and tortured on planet Earth than today which is, after all we know, and after all we have seen, it is an unbelievable thing how we can still go ahead torturing those poor animals 
and doing with them like it's our right to or our might we can screw the life of anybody basically that's a kind of a republican philosophy for industry for military might for world policing etc it kind of comes in the same way so mr modi said that india has something to offer and he didn't spell it out but actually the the key to that is vegetarians and who are the vegetarians the yogis so i think he didn't want to just scream it into everybody's face but here we start if we become more vegetarian the more we become the less problems will be for the planet and the less injustice will be done to the animal kingdom and that means also to the biodiversity because it's not only the animals which are being screwed here it's our very mother earth our pachamama like we say in south america she is being abused in such a way that tears cannot respond for it because there's not enough liquid in our eyes to respond to what it means a, a hectare of jungle being felt or burned just so that you can plant more soy for exporting it to to f make animals fat in Europe so they can eat more meat there's no way it works for it. so my personal interpretation is that Mr. Trump is our real friend because he spells it out our wrong lifestyle we cannot only hear about beautiful progressive ideas and not put them into practice and our so many progressive thinkers in Europe and America and many other places they have talked sweetly but they have not applied they have not applied the total boycott to all those who propagate and practice and become rich on the misery and suffering of animals etc etc and that's what mr trump is telling us now oh you nonsense i just shut down your environmental organizations i i just shut down your gmo protests i shut down and i'm going to make a wall there and i'm going to make more double the investment of the military which by the way we never need all the money for the military, incredible amounts needed for education, helping the people and for the healthcare system and so. But that's not his interest. So he's spelling out the weakness of our so-called environmentalists. You, I don't know if you heard about uh, cowspiracy. I'm a huge proponent, yes. A cowspiracy changed my life. It actually spawned me to create an online course entitled Conscious Eating 101, where I teach people how to transition to a plant-based diet because stopping eating animals, I see as the number one easiest way for us to solve the top problems in the world. Magda, you speak my heart. Right? Are so we on the same page? We or are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, that conspiracy. Yes pinpointed that the biggest environmental organizations ignored that fact that the animal killing is the supreme cause of all the injustice and all the nonsense. Actually, they changed a little bit after that movie. You I've seen a Greenpeace documentary against meat eating and, wow. and animal husbandry. I haven't seen that. That's yes, amazing. yes, yes. They, they have, they got the pinch yes. from that. Fantastic. Well, he's, he's creating waves then with his work. How Definitely. powerful, right? This conscious media, this one film. It is in the homework of my first lesson, of the 15 lessons in my e-course, the first homework assignment is to watch that film. Good. Because it is in an hour and a half, people can get all the information that they need. It's like a punch in the gut. It's like, oh, the truth hurts. But now you know. Now you're making an informed choice. So uh, this is what I teach. This is what I advocate, that food choice is that has the potential to be an expression of love, self-love, animal love, and plant love. Have you seen the new movie, Hope? There's Hope? No. From an Austrian. It's it's a, a take, a take. it starts off conspiracy and then goes into There is Hope. Oh. Very well done. Nice. Okay, I'll have to look for that one. We'll, we'll find it and we'll put it in the it's show just, notes. It's just recently was up. Fantastic.
fantastic. Yeah, there's there's more and more coming out. I'm, yes. I'm a big advocate for conscious media as well because these films are so powerful. They do help people get the awareness that they need to make the choices, to make the changes in their choices. Because it all comes down to choice, right? Especially with food. People don't understand how powerful of a choice it is when they go and look at the menu or they go to the grocery store. The choice to choose a plant or an animal to, to eat is, is like night and day. It's, it's you know, heaven and hell. <laughs> it's, you know, saving the world, killing the world. This one simple choice, people don't make that connection. And that's my mission, actually. It's my dharma to raise awareness about this point. So we're even... It's wonderful about like that. And I would even take it a step further. I say the moment I'm sitting with my family and I think about the world and I think about the food we are going to eat, try to by step the supermarket. Mm. Try to find sure. out is there anybody in your area who's growing organic food? Is there anybody who's protecting animals and not harming them? Then if there is or a club or a vegan club or a vegan restaurant or whatever, get together with them and make a plan that sure. your food comes from a trustworthy ground. Because for example in Europe Bio, 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 and it's an organic, they say. And they're cheating. The corporations take it over and make their, as usual, strange business. And then you get oranges, which are supposed to be organic, but they aren't. And they're coming from all, they're brought from Spain, and the whole thing is like, there's so much cheating. Because we should not forget that commerce today means cheating. <laughs> so, if we don't want to be cheated, we have to go all the way to the village level where we get together with our friends, let's get our lettuce, lettuce our salads and our, our flowers and whatever we want from this Mother Earth and let's pay for it. And if that's more costly than in the supermarket, that's safe. Right. Huh? That means you're probably getting something real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the ideal, right, is, is to have an eco-village. Or if you can't have an eco village, the next the next level would be to everybody on the block grows something different. So you can all have your you know eat the rainbow, eat the complete. Right? <laughs> everybody, you take your wagon down and you, you fill it up with your neighbors and you get something different from everyone. That would be ideal. Well, that's all. Right? That's like dreaming, no? <laughs> yes. But a beautiful but dream. It's a beautiful a dream. Beautiful dream. Let's but dream it. what you said about the eco village is really is really another step because it takes you into community life. And community life is much more than eating. Mm -hmm. But there's something very important I'd like to share with you, Magda, which is the evolution of eating. There is the cannibal who thinks he can eat anybody. It doesn't matter. Then, after the cannibal, we got those who do not eat human beings, but they eat everything else. Then, after that, comes the person who is saying, well, we will eat the animals, but no snakes and no dogs. They start discriminating. And then the others say, oh, yeah, we don't eat the cow. The others say, we don't eat the pig. So they start discriminating around the animal kingdom, what to eat and what not to eat. Then there comes a point, they say, hey, that's all you Let's eat no animals. Let's become vegetarian. We can live healthily in this way. Then, after that, you see that amongst the vegetarians, there's also uh, a few different levels of vegetarians. No? And uh, then come the vegans. And the vegans, or the lacto vegetarians, they divide it in two categories. One, they utilize milk products, but only if the animals are not hard. If they know that the family keeps cows nicely as part of the family and they grow old and die inside that family setting, then they accept this milk as a gift of cruelty God. free. Cruelty free. Then there's others, they just reject everything, they're just so vegan. And, uh, and in this way, they say, no animal products in my food whatsoever. And then further, the others they only eat fruits. Right. They know no killing of anything, just the fruits from the trees. And so there's an evolution in the eating. In India, we have taken that a little further. That you should not eat anything 
unless it was offered with love to God. It was planted with love. It was picked with love. It was prepared with love. And after it was offered to the Lord, to, to God in his infinite forms, is not a particular religion here invoked, invoked. After you do that, you receive those remnants, they're called prashadam, of mercy. And now it's your job to share this food with as many needy people are around you, including your own belly, you'll get something to be uh, satisfied. This is the spiritual food evolution, and that's the tradition of India. Every temple feeds people, and every home, by we, like for example, in the India, India there's something called Madukari. It means when the time of eating comes, you can go to anybody's home and stay in the door, and you just chant the name of God, and you bet somebody comes out and they give you some food that you have. That's called Madhukai. Saints and pilgrims have lived by that for ages. That's how they can live. Otherwise, you need to get a job and they get another way. So, but they go, and of course, they also contribute. It's not they're just like beggars. They're actually also giving their example and they may be talking to the family and like this. They are sometimes sannyasis or they're there are people who are uh, searching for the higher truths. Mm -hmm. So, but even if someone's a beggar, there's no reason not to share with them. So, so uh, one of my friends he took that principle to the perfection. The Indian government, Mr. Modi, he said, every child in India has a right for one hot meal a day if they go to school. And that's the Indian government's duty to supply that. Mm -hmm. So, but they didn't know how to do it. They made that law, but they didn't. So my friend, Madhu Pandit, he took that idea, he got a few corporate people involved, and he started the big prashadam kitchen. This prashadam kitchen today distributes 2.5 million plates a day. What they have done, a major operation of food distribution, all offered to the Lord, like in that spirit. Right. He just took it and said, no, not just the people in the door. I'll give it to all the kids of India. Mm. So this is how the dimension of the Indian thinking about food and, and how holy it is. And then when you take food with somebody together and, and you actually share this, the, the, feeling of gratefulness and compassion and brotherness, sisterness. That is life. Yes. These poor guys today, they sit in front of a TV, couple down something which they got from the supermarket, threw it into the microwave oven, right. and now they're just eating and they're going sick like a dog to right. the job to, right. to bear the rest of the day. That's what we call unconscious eating. <laughs> yeah. The opposite of what we're advocating here. Yeah. Yeah. But, but a huge issue all over the world, right? I mean, certainly I see it in the United States, and we're now exporting this lifestyle all over the world, right? And we're seeing the same diseases that are prevalent in the United States. We're exporting the diseases along with the, the food, the unconscious food. And the, the world is stupid eating. enough to buy it. Right. Well, you know, America has this glamour that people the like glamour. are you attracted to. You touched it. The glamour. Yeah. They're great salesmen mm -hmm. of packaging. Yeah. They can glamorously package disease. Right. And death. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's what's happening. So we're the counterbalance to that. So mm. I'm grateful for, for us and for this conversation. And, you know, I, I hope that we get a lot of people to listen to this and share it because this is, this is so crucial to the survival of our species and not only the survival, but the thrival, like for us to thrive as a species, right? Because Mother Earth. No problem. Shake us off like a bunch of fleas. I don't need you, <laughs> right? You know the way we're treating her. She's close, right? She's shaking us <clears> up. <throat> she's throwing all these storms around. She's like, she's upset, right? The way she's been treated. She doesn't need us. We need her, and that's the that's the shift that people need to make in their thinking. Right? Yes, you know, I come also from another side. I just started. I was lucky to be present when the United Nations of the Spirit was 
founded by the natives of Apiayala. Apiayala means from Alaska down to uh, Chile, south and tip. That's originally by the natives, they call this Apiayala. So the natives of Apiayala, they met, and they met in Colombia for a kiva. A kiva is a temple, you have that uh, document, it's a temple of the heart of Mother Earth. Yeah, this one. I leave you the, with this, you can read it and do whatever you like with this. So Abya Yala, they came together to talk exactly about what we are talking about here. How to counteract the, the disasters which are happening to our, the, our dear Mother Earth. And in that call, which was founded, we need unity. We need yoga on a higher level. So we need the United Nations of the spirit. Because the United Nations, which were started before, they were based with the paradigm that we cannot talk about God. God was eliminated from the United Nations when they started. Yeah. Most people don't know that. No. That's where the three founders said. They both, they all agreed that were Atheists, There's no God here. Okay. No, God doesn't fit into this. Okay. And so the, the natives, they said, the spirit is the essence. They said, you cannot solve the problems of this world by mechanically organizing some uh, NGOs and other things. No, we need the spirit and the responsibility. When the United Nations of the Spirit were pronounced, it was a movement to embrace the whole world. Now, we just embraced here in the yoga festival so many wonderful people. The uh, <laughs> people of the Lift Up, the Uplift, Uplift, Uplift Movement Connected. Yeah. They are now completely connected with the United Nations of the Spirit. Mm. And in the next Kumbha Mela, the Arta Kumbha Mela, we will have a united festival of all the people, the, the chiefs from the Apyayala coming to India, Unite in the Kumbha Mela with the Indian Saints. Wow, when is that? What year is that? That will be January 2019. Okay, mark your calendars, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Be there for that. The largest spiritual gathering on the planet. Yes. Wow, I would love to be present for that. You probably will. Yeah, I think at this point, there's a good, real good chance I'm going to be there. I don't see myself missing it. <laughs> so, this is the, the call for unity from that side of those natives, they pronounce, they know how to spell out what Mother Earth wants us to hear. They're like those genuine representatives of our dearest mother. And they teach us things because they're also living, they have communities, they have to maintain and, and uh, of course, whatever they say, it's adapting to our current reality. Because mm -hmm. even though they're coming from the jungles and from the Haumahai mountains, they don't even know what's going on yeah. in the world today. It's the 100th monkey syndrome as well, right? I mean, energetically, they know what's going on, even if they're not reading the newspaper or Facebook right uh -huh. out loud. They right. know what's going on. So, and that call has come to us. They have pronounced the nine points, principle of the United Nations of the Spirit. And it is all about weaving a tapestry of consciousness and love. Speak in my language again. That's what we're here for. This yes, is incredible. Definitely. That's what we're here for. And that's what everybody needs to be woven in with his own extended love to be part of it. Yes. So, and, and this is a spiritual revolution because it will not allow to exclude anybody. Right. It's totally based on mercy. Mm -hmm. And those who are still working for Monsanto, they're not our enemies. They are the victims, and we will also get them <coughs> to come back home. Right, yes. Huh? I have, I, see, I, I, see, I see them as lost, right? I mean, yes. I, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't really believe in evil. I believe that anybody that's 
you know, behaving in a way that we might deem as evil is simply a child of God who's lost. Definitely. You agree? Definitely. I agree with you. So we need to bring them back home, like we say. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions for you about the food. Um, vegan versus vegetarian. Um, in the United States, the dairy industry is fraught with cruelty, right, and environmental destruction. The dairy industry is responsible for, as we know, Cowspiracy yes. gave us a lot of statistics on this. So why not advocate veganism as opposed to vegetarianism? We do. You do? Yes, we do. Okay. We only advocate uh, milk production if that is a compassionate origin, and that is only available to very few people. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't find a supermarket participating. And only because of our stupidity. Because if you spell it out into reality, I mean, milk products are delicious. We all like ice cream and all that stuff. But it can easily be produced without harming the animals. Right. The only problem is that it five or six times more expensive right. because you have to spend the time when mother gets old mm -hmm. and feed her all the way mm -hmm. and make sure whatever she has because when she is old she's still giving stool, she's still giving urine. Urine is more expensive. Cow urine is more expensive than cow milk. It has so many fantastic applications. So by doing a real comprehensive animal protection plan, mm -hmm. yes, we would have all milk products, delicious just as now, but without the animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. But nobody has come to that yet, mm -hmm. to draw except some individuals. No? Yeah, well, I mean, why not just do it from coconuts and cashews, and they're healthier anyway, right? Because the, the dairy products are not even so healthy, so. You are right and you are wrong. The ori original breed, of Indian cows. They used to give such a nectar milk which would cure you of all the diseases. The Vedas are full of the glory of milk. The cow is given the third position of Divine Mother. She's been there in the Vedas as celebrity. Mm -hmm. Her milk products are utilized directly in the worship of the deities of the sacrifices and all. At the same time, the cow protection is a family affair. The, not only the cow is necessary, the bull is necessary. He's the oxen, he makes the oil, he makes the sugar cane into the gore. Because he's powerful. Yeah. He goes to plow the field with the with the, uh, the husband, while mother is taking care. The cows are so much part of the family. Mm. They're, they're, they're more, much more part of the family than a pet, which you keep nowadays in some apartment. Sleeping in the bed, yeah. Huh? <laughs> so the, these concepts of cow protection there, they're very lovely, but they need supervision, animal, up. Uh, government sympathy, there got to be something, what if they die, who they want to do. So in India they have goshalas, they are called cows old people homes. Oh my gosh, really? Yes, I have one. Like retirement community yes. for the cows? Yes, I started one goshalas. of them, a goshala in Radha Kunda. I love that, I did not know that. <laughs> oh, yay! That is amazing. Well, what do we, so, yeah, on cows, because India, I understand the, the cows are divine here, and I, I'm the first cow I saw on the street, I was just, you know, so excited. It's true, the cows are free in the streets here, but. but I didn't finish the most important sorry, point of the on. question, which was that these cows of India, so glorified, they are actually, their milk was pure medicine. And the children would get a very good brain tissues from that, and so, mm. and that's why uh, very highly appreciated. Once the cows started being abused, once they started being injected to produce more milk, once they were giving hormones and nasty foods to eat, that curing effect of the milk 
turned exactly into the opposite, causing the same diseases that pure original milk of the breed of India was curing. When I found out about that, I became vegan. Okay. And I said, then it was just an urgency. We cannot keep making ourselves sick voluntarily, supporting anything like that. But like, like I say, veganism has also some drawbacks because we need the manure of the cows for the, for the healthy food to eat. Uh, chemical fertilizer is not the answer. The cow manure is a great, a great, great what thing. What about compost? Compost is very good, yes. Is there not a, a enough compost? I, I couldn't tell you that scientifically, mm. but I just know that in our eco farms, uh, we are very happy when we get hold of some cow manure. Mm -hmm. How many eco villages do you have? Well, you know, between small and big, uh, developing 70. 70, so, all over the world? Something like that. Yeah, you know, wherever some land is available and people are into yoga and meditation, we make an eco village. Okay. Maybe very small, maybe three families only, mm -hmm. or maybe also a larger settlement. And it's it's more than everything else. It 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 is the spirit of it, of wanting to live in harmony with nature, making seed banks like Mandala Shiva. She gave me instructions how to make the seed banks oh, and uh, and also you know one more thing of the eco villages is, is not the animals is the humans have to bring them out into the country they are they're mm. screwed they're in the cities they the poor kids the poor women and they, there's no life there's no quality bring them to the forest let them see where, where, what it sounds when the water runs down the stream yeah. oh no so, so for me I'm you could almost say I'm a country addict. Mm. So, so, so wherever I find some of those precious places and there's some reasonable people there that want to do such a thing, I'm trying to inspire them. Because you can imagine when you're around a, a traveling monk like myself, uh, you don't carry any more responsibilities mm -hmm. except of sharing with others what you feel is important. Right. Oh, it's so beautiful. When, when did this Eco Village project start? When did the first one get created? How you know, long the, have you been doing it? The Eco Village concept that was started in Fintorn in Scotland, and then it went to New York. Then there was an Eco an Eco Village started. And they were like uh, practically a little bit out of the hippie movement. It started, but. I came from a different side. I came from the Eco Yoga village because we always are doing the yoga communities and and making centers of attending the public in the cities. But as I say, we don't want our children to grow up in the city. So, right. so for we felt the need that wherever you have a community, you have to come outside and find some greenery and some clean water and some clean air and then there you invite the people and in this way it goes for and back and uh, yeah then at some point eco village movement and eco yoga village movement joined into what is called uh, in South America it's called CASA. Mm. CASA it's like a, a joint effort to we have uh, large gatherings where uh, usually we do the cooking uh, and, and we have lectures on permaculture and all the mm -hmm. things which because there's many things you can learn as far as living in, in a nice way in the country you know? sure you know, you know, technologies also yes yeah you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the whole eco village movement i know a couple of people i've spent some time who have built beautiful eco villages in different places and i go there and i say wow this is the solution um villages are amazing. I want to I want to go back to the cows for a minute. Um, the cow is, is divine in India, and I, I love having these conversations here and learning more about 
the whole background about why cows are divine and, and, how, and how they're treated. I see them here on the streets, you know, eating the garbage and the plastic bags, and I know there are people, including Swami G, working on this. Um, but the bigger question that I'm wondering if you know if there's anybody working on the fact that India is the largest exporter of beef of all the countries. Is there anyone addressing that? Like, how's that disconnect happening? There is absolutely uh, schizophrenic approach to this issue. Uh, it's not healthy, and the answer will not be satisfying because the plastic is on the road and the cows do eat it and they do die from eating that plastic. And on the larger scale, actually Mr. Modi addressed it today. Holy cities have to be exemplary, they have to clean up their show. I was very happy to hear him say that. It needs a presidential order for, yeah. that, for them to change the certain things. And uh, yes, of course, and, it's, it's, I think the volume of India is also the answer for that, all these, these things and of the huge volume, there is not everybody a Hindu and cow protector, mm -hmm. there is a lot, lot of people, they make their money by killing the animals mm -hmm. and usually they take the animals to areas where nobody objects to killing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this way, but it's for me it's also schizophrenic because they should do something about it much stronger. I mean, some states have prohibited cow killing, okay. hmm? and then it's still somehow be going on. It's a schizophrenic. So I can only answer to you in the word of Mahatma Gandhi, which who said cows cannot be protected until the government assumes that responsibility. Mm. And uh, whether that's going to take place and when. It will take place, I cannot give you the answer, but I think it's a very good cause to be taken up. Yeah. But I think I have causes as far as cleaning and preserving uh, the, the heritage of India, but this cause has to be taken up by Muniji mm -hmm. and his powerful voice, yes. because he does have quite an impact. Yes, yes, I'd like to see that. Yes, because this is a question that comes up as I'm sharing my journey. And in India. I welcome you to ask it to him regarding the cows in Rishikesh. Mm. Because the cows in Rishikesh, uh, they, they, in Rishikesh is not a big place. They could do something about Well, I, I interviewed Sadhiji and she explained to me that they had an, they got a piece of land down the river and they took a bunch of the cows there as a sanctuary and a bunch of the women from the villages came out and took the... Um, government official, is it Mr. Mooney? Um, out, I'm not sure, I don't remember the name, out of his office and beat him because the cows were no longer free. So there's this disconnect between the people in the villages not understanding that they're actually trying to protect the cows. So that, that was one effort that they made that I know they're readdressing. So I know something is being done on that, but the beef exporting, I was surprised, really surprised to learn about that India being the number one with, with the culture you know, worshipping the cow, it just, it's just, it's schizophrenic it's, is the answer. Yes, yeah. totally. And it's not satisfactory, but it, at least it explains it. At least it's, there's some logic there now, at least I understand. That's, thank you for that. Uh, what else would you like people to know? <laughs> uh, what, How much time do we have? <laughs> what, yes, what, what we would like people to know, that life is a miracle that every second is precious, that there's nothing bad which doesn't come from good reason, and that if we feel pressed, pressed and pained by certain things, make that a good reason for doing something very good. We are all going to die in this world, but our souls are eternal, so it's what you don't do this lifetime, well, you're going to be going on doing it next time. So better you do it now than next time you find something more exciting and more important. The life and the creation, the law of karma, is something so uh, generous with us that uh, according to Bhagavad Gita, even the very factor of death should not be over-exaggerated over the real 
proportion of the importance of life, consciousness, and love. If I can love now, that is much more important than one million of deaths which could occur or will occur. But if I do not love, then all is lost. So whether we born or we are dying, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, those who are born, they will die. Those who are dying, they will be born again. So mm, means let's focus on why we live and not what is the reason that we have to give up this body because this is nothing more than one of the original laws. Mm -hmm. And the underlying original laws of nature, they are the ones who show us that we are one, one nation, one humanity, that there's one beautiful Mother Earth, that there's this sun, this amazing eye of divine, which comes into every nook and corner, lighting up our life like this beautiful place right now. And this sun is a divine reality. So if you have any problem with organized religion, I don't blame you. They have really behaved themselves so badly. They blew it. But you can't deny the sun and the earth. You can't deny the water and the, and the elements. And you cannot deny the beauty of love because you are love hungry and you are also full of love looking to whom to give that love. So all that is not negative. There's nothing negative about it. So let's explore the positivity. Let's explore what humans have to do. And the science of yoga is the science of consciousness, the science of the soul, or we can call it a spiritual science, which is not unscientific, but it is so spiritual that it really points to the, the crucial issues of our existence, which is that all we need is love, and then love comes from above. And when we give this love to everybody else, we get more. And, it multiplies. Yeah, it multiplies. There, there is something mystical which goes on. And that's what everybody's looking for. Right. Yes, I, I like to say that we're here to give and receive love. This is our, you know, to perfect the art of giving and receiving love. Yes. Right? Definitely. Yeah. Love is the answer. I mean, there's so many bumper stickers we can make out of this. But, but and so many people are aware of this. Why do so many people struggle with it? Why? Why? Is the world in such turmoil? Why, what's stopping us from figuring it out? Is it ego? We are in Kali Yuga. Mm. The Kali Yuga, according to the Vedas, is the last of four ages. And it is still lasting 427,000 years or something like that. And it is an age where spirituality is becoming more scarce and scarce and scarce. And in there, in that scarcity, appear certain bubbles of enlightenment one can take hold of. Mm -hmm. For example, in other ages, self-realization was propounded by meditation, by making very opulent worship, worships, yagyas, mm -hmm. by worshiping mm -hmm. in big temples. But in this age, it says, you can approach the divine just by chanting. If you are chanting, appealing for this love, if you are having some deep repentance about your own involvement with life in the wrong way, there will be an amnesty. And that amnesty is always available to anybody who takes that. This is for the whole age. So in this way, there's a, there's a negative thing, but there's a remedy. The Vedas have given, it's called Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Eva Kevalum, Kalauna Steva, Nasteva, Nasteva, Dati, Anyata. In this age of quorum, which is also, there is no other way to get out of the insanity, seven except if we start chanting the divine invocations of God's presence. And there's no hard and fast rules how to do that. It's not belonging to anybody. Huh? It's a process which John comes from the grateful heart. And, uh, I see it work. 
I've seen the transformation take place. People can give up drugs, they can give up meat eating in no time. They can give up irresponsibility with the family. So many things and you see, I belong to a monastic order from India, but I spend most of my time outside of India. And the people come to me or I meet, they're just as hungry for some spiritual insight as, as everybody else uh, there. And they receive this type of message so gratefully. Even though when you go to the native people there, the original nations, they know it all. They also know about the law of karma, they know about action and reaction. They know about individual responsibility. They know about love. So, right now with the United Nations of the Spirit, I think there's a, there's a good hope. Yeah, I'm feeling really hopeful today. We, we have to do Being it. Being here and witnessing all the like-minded people and the high vibrations here in India, this yoga festival in particular, it's, you know, it, it renews my hope for the world and sitting and sharing, you know, having you share your wisdom here. It's, it means so much and I know that so many people are going to benefit from hearing this message and just from your presence and your energy and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time and just all your love. So much love. The minute I saw you, I just walked up to you to ask if I could help you register and you just threw your arms around me and gave me this giant hug. You're just like... The personification of love, you are. Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for you your like time. Good, good energy for all those who are listening to us and let them be torch carriers like you. Yes, yes. That's all we are, but that torch yes. makes the difference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Hare Krishna. And tonight we're going to have this Harinama. Yeah? Yes. From 8 to 9.30. Oh, you didn't know what she? You know how to turn. Stop it. Ah.